You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a review of Ayn Rand's book, The Virtue of Selfishness. And it's a Skype discussion that I had with a group of friends talking about this book. Just by way of a bit of background, uh, the book was written in the early 1960s and it outlines Ayn Rand's philosophy of ethics. It's a non-fiction book, a collection of essays. And just to give you a sense of the kind of essays that are covered, um, I'm just going to read out some of the titles from the table of contents. The Objectivist Ethics, Mental Health versus Mysticism and Self-Sacrifice. The Ethics of Emergencies, The Conflicts of Men's Interests, Isn't Everyone Selfish? The Psychology of Pleasure, Doesn't Life Require Compromise? How Does One Lead a Rational Life in an Irrational Society? The Cult of Moral Grayness, Collectivized Ethics, Government Financing in a Free Society, Racism, Counterfeit Individualism, the argument from intimidation, and some other essays in there as well. So I hope that gives you an overview of the kind of topics that are covered in the book, and I hope you enjoy our discussion. Thank you so much for listening. This is so cool. I'm really glad that we all managed to get together and and talk about this book. I read it um, uh, a few weeks ago now, about a month ago, Um, and so I'm really curious to see what what everyone made of this one, because I I think I've got some... There are some things about this book that I really love and some things that I, I, I'm less keen on, um, which is kind of, that's the thing about Ayn Rand. I, I, really, I really like Ayn Rand. There are some things that kind of frustrate me a little bit with her, but, um, but I just wanted to say that I, what I, one of the things that I really like about this book is the title. I just think it's awesome. And I was reading on Wikipedia that apparently there's a whole debate about the title because some people think it's not really an exact she doesn't really mean selfishness and she's got her own definition and other people have said that it's um it it's it really puts people off i personally i think it's one of the best things about the book because it's like this is what iron rand's like you know she just she really has a lot of guts and she likes to just go for the moral argument in the, in in often the most sort of um direct and sometimes um, inflammatory way for people who uh, come from a kind of collectivist viewpoint. And I really, I really admire that about her. And um, so I, I think it's a great title. There's um, a feminist libertarian, I can't remember what her name is, but um, Stephanie, you might remember, it's that woman who was at Libertopia, um, who, who did a couple of... Is it Sharon Presley? Yeah, yeah. Apparently, Sharon Presley, according to Wikipedia, has criticized Ayn Rand for this title and says that she, she thinks it's completely confusing for people and stuff. I don't think it's at all confusing because... Well, I, I, I mean, you have to consider the context, I think, because literally a lot of the things that Ayn Rand was saying was she was the only one who was saying this stuff. Yeah. And, and she, I think, I would assume she was just trying to draw a huge parallel between what she saw all around her and what she thought of as virtuous. Yeah. In in the introduction, didn't she talk about the fact that the, I mean, maybe this isn't a newer version of the book that I had read, but I thought she had discussed the fact that the title was, you know, risque. And yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, she does. And as far as I remember, she sort of says like, yeah, yeah, I understand, you know, maybe you're going to misunderstand, but you know what I mean. And I'm saying that, um, that actually the, within the, the society that thinks that collectivism is the, and altruism is the highest ideal, I'm talking about the virtue and the inevitability of everyone acting in their rational self-interest, which makes perfect sense to me, and I think it's a great title. It's almost like the word capitalism, too. She really, um, you know, she used that word very heavily in a lot of her work, but later on, it's been really criticized and today the meaning is completely muddled and changed from what she meant it as. Yeah. And I can, I can certainly understand the argument and there is a sort of sense, like I think a lot of people have have got a sense of like, Oh, don't say that you'll frighten the horses. You know, this sort of like that approach to the use of words like selfish and capitalism. 
And what I like about Ayn Rand is that she was like, fuck that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own these words, you know? She's <laughs> I... very un unapologetic yes. about these things. She doesn't uh, give anyone any uh, space to uh, say, no, you didn't mean that, you really meant logical altruism or anything like that. No, she doesn't want anyone to interpret it like that. She says selfishness as, you know, rational self-interest. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, and I thought that the use of selfishness gave her a really good opportunity in her introduction to introduce, uh, I think one of, I don't know if she was the first person to call it this, but it was, I thought it was a pretty innovative way to talk about it, which was package deals, which was when she talked, she was like frustrated that people lump you know, say one word, which is a completely neutral word, selfish, right? And then they just mean, like, a guy with a mustache in a back room, like, plotting how he can take away all your money, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And so I, I liked that she used the word if only because she gave, I think, a pretty uh, pretty good introduction to that concept in, in this book. Mm. That sounded to me like uh, Joseph Stalin, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I really like that about this book. And I was just going to say the other things that I really like. There's a, a fantastic quote. Um, George, I know that you've written this somewhere as well, and I can't remember it word for word, but it comes from this book and it's in there. And it, it, she says something like, um, if you're in favor of minority rights, the smallest minority is the, in, in, is the individual. And oh. protecting the individual is, is is like that's how sort of. And I just think it's saying that it's hypocritical to pretend. Well, you, you cannot pretend to be a defender of minorities and then not protect the smallest one of those. Things. Exactly. Yeah, which I think is a beautiful argument, and uh, and it's another one like especially when she's writing this in the nineteen sixties when the left was very much like um, in favour of uh, civil rights, but against individual rights of, about things like, um, you know, the free market, which is a completely contradictory position. But I think that's a really, it's a great quote. Um, and she puts it a lot more succinctly in the book. So um, those are some of the things that I uh, thought was, uh, was really good about this book. I've got some criticisms as well, but uh, I, does anybody else have any, uh, have anything uh, that they wanted to say about it? I, just before moving on from the introduction, um, one thing that I, I found, you know, amusing because I, I had forgotten this the first time I saw it was the um, P.S. Nathaniel Brandon is no longer associated with Ayn Rand or Jack. Like that was, I think, the first time that she publicly like wrote in an introduction yeah. of one of her books. Yeah, yeah. That, that you know, Nathaniel Brandon was. Yeah, you know, this is communicated. This is obviously it's during. The movie. Sorry. Have you seen the movie, the, um, the Passion of Ayn Rand or something like that? There's a movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where yeah. all that relationship is uh, described. Um, yeah. It dramatizes that moment, doesn't it? And where yeah. she gets, uh, where she, she's, um, she slaps Nathaniel. And I think that comes from his autobiography. Um, but yeah, I, I, it is his kind of house a shame. too. Sorry? Barbara Brandon too, I right. think had to. I was saying that well, the main reason I brought that uh, the Nathaniel Brandon PS um, in up was uh, I'll I'll put a link in the chat room about this and maybe you could put this in the show notes if when it becomes a podcast, Jake. But mm. Nathaniel Brandon years ago wrote a really really astute criticism of objectivism, and I'd I'd never read it. I'd read Murray Rothbard's that he wrote, but I'd never read Nathaniel Brandon's, and he talks a lot about sort of some of the psychological dangers of you know, adhering to objectivism too strongly. So I think it would be a really nice counterpoint to a lot of the stuff that she talks about um, in this it's book. It's too late for me. I cannot read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll link that in the chat room. What did you think with the, like, what did you take from it, Greg, in terms of what, what he was saying? From the article? Did you, did you read it too, Jake? No, I haven't, I haven't read it. What I took from it was, there, like, the, the, one of the most compelling parts of that to me was when he does therapy, people obviously associate him with objectivism in Iran. So a lot of objectivists come to him and want to, you know, they're not feeling satisfied, they're not feeling fulfilled, and they'll come to him for help. And one guy was like just distraught because he uh, didn't think that his girlfriend was doing like a Dagny Taggart 
you know, so anything like Dagny Taggart esque with her life. She wasn't running a train company. She wasn't changing the world. <laughs> and then Nathaniel Brandon, in a, in an effort to be gentle with him and like assure him, well, this is okay. No one's Dagny Taggart. He said, well, but in all fairness, you're not John Galt, and that actually made made the guy more sad and like brought him into an even bigger pit of despair. And this like idea of like comparing yourself to these like idealized characters. That was one of the things that he talked about. And also this just, yeah, well, the, yeah, I'll, I'll link to it, but that was the most um, emotionally poignant part of that article for me, which, because I was like that I, when I was full-on objectivist, like, trying to be, you know, John Galt or Hank Reardon or Howard Rourke. Yeah, I guess, like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed thing, because on the one hand, like, she really is uh, uh, great at saying, you know, take responsibility for your life and fucking do something with it, right? And and I think that's kind of a cool message, you know. But on the other hand, there is um, there is a weird sense in which her characters do become these these sorts of cardboard cutouts that don't have a lot of internal conflict and don't have a lot of struggle getting to where they want to 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 be. Like, like we were talking about before, the Howard Rourke is just kind of born uh, as Howard Rourke. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't actually have to struggle to free himself from the, uh, from the, um, you know, the kind of uh, ideas that uh, he's surrounded by. He just is completely sort of uh, chiselled from the beginning, so to speak. So, yeah, I think it, it, it she doesn't really, um, she doesn't have as much help, I think, in terms of how you get to where you want to go, but she does pro provide a kind of sense of vision of, of uh, taking self-responsibility. I think she does it a bit with Gail Wynand on the Fountainhead, where she shows how he changed. Right. And also I have a great diagram that I found somewhere in front of me where it takes the Atlas Shrugged characters and puts them into a X and Y axis, basically, thing for, with four um, uh, parts. And on the uh, Y axis, it's got morality. Mm. Top, you have good, and bottom, you have evil. And then on the uh, X axis, you've got uh, incompetent and genius ability. So it, it, uh, it categorizes them in those. And, you know, you've got good characters that are not John Goats. Right. Eddie, Eddie Wyler, for example, or um, the newsstand owner, where they're, they're kind of hero worshipper and they're good, but they're not heroes. But that doesn't matter because they're still good in terms of morality. It's just uh, they're not capable so much. So I think uh, Ayn Rand had also some characters that uh, weren't capable to be heroes, but they were still all right. She just couldn't obviously write a book about them because there's not much interesting about them going on. So, you know, I understand from that point of view. Yeah. <laughs> Those were just some salient links I wanted to post so that they'd be here so I could just bring them up real quick. They were from that, that article that I mentioned. Mm. Uh, and Can he said, so... Out? Yeah, I will. So one of them was another aspect of her philosophy. This is Nathaniel Brandon speaking. Another aspect of her philosophy that I would like to talk about, one of the hazards, is the appalling moralism that Ayn Rand herself practiced and that so many of her followers also practice. I don't know of anyone other than the church fathers in the Dark Ages who used the word evil quite so often as Ayn Rand. <laughs> and then in another section, let's suppose a person has done something that he or she knows to be wrong, immoral, unjust, or unreasonable. Instead of acknowledging the wrong, instead of simply regretting the action and then seeking compassionately to understand why the action was taken and asking where was I coming from and what need was I trying to, in my own twisted way, to satisfy. Instead of asking such questions, the person is encouraged to brand the behavior as evil and is given no useful advice on where to go from there. You don't teach people to be moral by teaching them self-contempt as a virtue. And that really struck uh, struck out, uh, or stood out to me when I read that article. Right, right. So you mean the the argument being that she's such a harsh moralizer that um, it becomes kind of self flagellation. Right. That it's and that I think that comes back to like the like guy who felt despair that he's not John Galt. It's like oh my gosh, then I'm not perfect. That I'm not this god of virtue, this demigod of virtue. And I. I that really does strike me as something that is, you know, at once I, I love what she wrote about, about, you know, 
the the dangers of the gray area. I think she wrote that chapter in this book, and you know, the the, the benefits of having an objective morality. I think there is this too far bit in there, which is like when you just okay, I've done something evil. Wow, I'm I'm just not a virtuous person. I'm just evil. I'm just bad, right? It's so interesting, Greg, because like Brandon is basically talking about self compassion or self empathy, and the difference between like basically judging yourself and like Jake said, self flagellation, and understanding you know why you did what you did and what needs you were trying to meet within yourself, and then you know empathizing with yourself, giving yourself a break, and it's really interesting because I I think I even see a lot of that today. Like, I don't know, there are some people who, <laughs> who get so into the, the sort of judgment side of things that they don't really have room for empathizing with themselves or other people. You know what I mean? Like just for an example, sometimes when people talk about voting, um, <laughs> they don't really, <laughs> right. they, they don't really consider like, okay, well, why would a person um, want to engage in voting? What, what needs do they believe they're meeting for themselves or what are they trying to sort of get satisfied no, it's just like, oh, you're evil. You know, you're you're participating in this evil system, and I agree that I I think it's an evil system. But to judge the person who who participates in it when maybe they don't have that knowledge or whatever, and maybe they could be, you could get through to them more by by just sort of like under, being a little more understanding. Yeah, it's it's interesting because. Uh, I'm really not sure what to think about it because, um, or rather, I do. I think two different things about it. I, d- I understand the argument completely about Ayn Rand's um, harsh uh, sort of a potential impact on people's personal lives and the way that they kind of got into sort of self-criticism or moralizing. On the other hand. I also admire the fact that she that she did go so hardcore into the argument for morality because she was so alone in that, you know. Like, there's a chapter in this book about communism and about Russia, and she's making the, really the argument for morality. And I think she was kind of alone at the time in doing that because there were a lot of people saying, you know, that it doesn't sort of it doesn't work as well as the West or whatever. But she was sort of really making the moral case. And on a big scale, you know, in terms of things like the free market, she, you know, making the argument for morality, I think was one of the sort of really brave things that she did as an individual because it was so unusual because the other people were making a kind of economic efficiency argument, but they weren't talking about the difference between coercion and you know, non-aggression, and she does talk about. Even though she's a little confused about the non-aggression principle, she does totally make that argument. On the other hand, um, you know, she obviously was a very, very. Uh, she was a very, very difficult person in in terms of the way that she dealt with with well friends and other people, and some of the things that she did. You know, her constant going on about intellectual property, for example, and her, her idea that you couldn't call yourself an objectivist, you could only call yourself a student of objectivism because nobody could represent, you know, she was so precious about, about that, which I think was actually, actually worked against her because it meant that she was trying to sort of, um, she got stuck in these arguments about who said what first and whose ideas were more original and who else's rather than just you know, actually getting on with it. Um, so it's a kind of odd mixture because I think in some senses her, one of her greatest strengths also maybe because she was so alone in being a moralist um, and maybe because she also had such a, such a tough time of it having escaped the Soviet Union and obviously had a totally traumatic childhood that maybe that's why, you know, she was kind of scarred in that way that she, that, um, that meant that she found it pretty difficult to to, to have empathy for people. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, yeah, it, it's an odd mixture of the thing that, one of the things that's the best thing about Ayn Rand is also kind of, on the flip side, one of her real weaknesses. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that she she didn't pick up, like, the ability to empathize with herself or, or with other people 
um, especially if Nathaniel Brandon was talking like this, like he's talking in this essay, and they were together for so long and had so so many conversations. I mean, because this stuff, what he's saying is really striking at at like a huge, um, a hugely important point. And it seems like he he understands from what he's saying that when you um, like you can have objective morality, you can have moral standards and and values and all that, um, and having those standards and values for yourself um, doesn't mean projecting moral judgment onto other people. You know, it doesn't mean moralizing in the same way that that she did a lot of. You know, using this word evil all the time and 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 there's room for there's room for empathy in there as well as sort of an objective um moral code yeah um but i guess how do you cuz like in in a sense like i think it's pretty cool that she called she called aggression um evil cuz i mean cuz it is you know i mean it is objectively and morally wrong and it is um, uh, it, the things that she's pointing out, like, well, I mean, just the example that comes to mind is the Soviet Union, but he, and, and, you know, she could have gone a lot further uh, with, with maybe the, the, the state in, in the West. On the one hand, you know, that, I think it's pretty cool to call that evil, because it is objectively wrong. But when you apply it to, I suppose, questions that aren't to do with aggression, like, for example, relationship with Nathaniel Brandon and like you know relationship with lots of other people that she had very very fractious relationships with that's where I think you know maybe she got a bit locked into battle mode you know yeah well, I think, oh sorry oh sorry uh, just a quick comment I mean Jake I think you were mentioning before about like uh, there there was nowhere to go like in Ayn Rand's work there was nowhere to go like after you know she would just condemn people as evil and then like after that it's like okay well what do you do and I, I think that's the major difference because whereas Brandon was kind of trying to understand like why would people do an, an action that would might be evil or like what need are they trying to meet what are they trying to do uh, Ayn Rand would just say oh it's evil and then discard it you know go over here and there was really nowhere to go so even something like communism or something like governments um, that she condemned as evil, it's like, okay, well, you can condemn it, but what's next after that, right? What what happens? And I don't know. Mm. I was going to add, too, that mm, my overall impression of her view of morality is that she does not make a hard distinction between... Um, morality as around the initiation of force and what um, some other people might call sort of aesthetic morality. And so um, for her, for her my, my general impression is that it's different shades of evil. Um, oftentimes she would equate evil to the unwillingness to think. And... <clears throat> So I think that if, if you think of uh, all, you know, not preferable actions as different shades of, of evil, then that really uh, lends itself to moralizing. Whereas if you're able to make a distinction between uh, actions that involve force or coercion or fraud or whatever, and things that are simply just, you know, not, not preferable, but not evil per se, then that uh, gives you some more uh, subtlety in your understanding of morality. Yeah, I can see exactly what you mean. In other words, like basically, initiation of aggression is a, a kind of, is the kind of pretty basic and simple thing. Um, but she, because she also thinks that not only is there an objective morality about the use of force, but there's an objective aesthetics, and there are objectively more sort of moral you know literature and art and everything else it sort of all flows into one um as opposed to it being simply a question of of uh you know whether or not someone's initiating ag aggression against you as being the, the kind of the moral question yeah probably that's a problem that she didn't prioritize so you know you can be very good at following the non-aggression principle but have a bad taste in architecture <laughs> you know, you're a pretty good person in my eyes, but probably in nine rounds you're uh, just as bad because yes. you, you like bad architecture. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you don't like tap dancing. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's in her um, book on aesthetics, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that's the moral. According to Ayn Rand, the, the moral form of dancing is tap dancing. And when I when I read that, I was like, okay, Ayn, Ayn, you've gone a bit wrong somewhere. <laughs> does, it, does it have any views about pole dancing or no? <laughs> Uh, oh. it, it, it's kind of it's an odd book that one it's kind of an interesting read because you do see where it goes a little bit her, her ideas go a little bit haywire because she starts categorizing different types of dance and saying that tap is more moral because it's more modern and that you know more uh atavistic dancing is I irrational and that you know so Basically, you shouldn't, the, you shouldn't shake your pelvis around too much because you're not using your rationality when you're dancing, I think is the issue, Brian Rand. <laughs> my, fa my favorite part of that book was when she, I think, quite racistly called rock and roll like tribal jungle music or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Which then, uh, that sounds like a real black and white uh, movie from the 50s, you know. <laughs> what is this tribal jungle music? <laughs> uh, Mid-century, mid mid Midwest morality. Right. So, Jake, I'm curious. You said that there were, um, you know, some parts of the book that you liked and some that you didn't. And I think we've we've been talking about like you know parts that we don't like. What what parts did you like? What did you well, enjoy? Said, the, specific sections. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I I I like Iron Rand's just um, real. Um, I, I enjoy um, Iron Rand's totally uncompromising sort of like real uh, strength of character in the way that she expresses uh, herself against the grain. So the stuff on uh, that she wrote about communism, the stuff she writes about individual rights, um, even though the definition of rights, you know, you can get, you get picky about these kind of things, but I really enjoyed that. I love the title. I love her defense of, uh, of um, the individual. Um, I really like all, all that stuff. And I, I, the things that I, the some of the, some of the other things that I had uh, difficulty with though is um, there's actually a really disappointing non critique of voluntarism in this book. Um, she oh, talk, yeah. she talks about her ideal being voluntary taxation, mm -hmm. and she very very briefly touches on the idea of market anarchism over like a matter of a few paragraphs, and she just completely dismisses it. And it, it's uh, it's such a non. It, it's like she dismisses it of it on the grounds that it's not even worth talking about because it's just ridiculously impractical. And she makes, I think, one argument about, oh well, how would two defense agencies ever come to an agreement? And you know, just kind of the most simple case that anyone who spent five minutes thinking about market anarchism has wondered about these case studies and has run them through their heads. And people have written, you know, volumes of literature on these kind of problems, but she just dismisses it out of hand without really even thinking about it. And I think that is um, something that Ayn Rand uh, had a real um, blockage to, to seeing because she ultimately, she is a, a market anarchist in her heart, I believe, you know, Galt's Gulch has no government and you know, she 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 clearly hates the state um, at a very deep level, but she just couldn't get around the idea of the minimal state and its necessity. She just couldn't um, spend the time to actually really run through the arguments for how you know how unnecessary the state is, and and to um, to think seriously about it. And I think that was a real weakness of the book. Well, I, I thought that, you know, so you mentioned that she was a voluntary, she was for voluntary taxation. I mean, uh, her dismissal of anarchism is just a joke. It's, mm. I highlighted some where she says, anarchy as a floating abstraction, uh, or as a political concept, is a naive floating abstraction for all the reasons discussed above. A society without an organized government would be at the mercy of the first criminal who came along and who precipitated into the chaos of gang warfare. And then, like, later on, she's saying, like, what about Mr. Smith and his, he's got one competing government, and Mr. Jones, and da-da-da. What happens then? You take it from there. And it's like, oh, no, you don't get to just stop your argument at you take it from there with this ominous tone. And, but yeah. then in the next chapter, she after she's talking about naive floating abstractions and ideas that couldn't actually work, she says stuff about, 
collecting of voluntary taxation in a fully free society taxation, or to be exact, payment for governmental services, would be voluntary. But then she like refuses, she says, it's a very complex one, this question of how it would work, and belongs to the field of the philosophy of law. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. If you're talking about naive floating abstractions and not discussing how things will work, you don't get to just say, oh yeah, but taxation would be voluntary. There we go, I've avoided the concept of force. It's like, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I thought that was, um, that was really disappointing. And I, I mean, it's something that I've found very disappointing about, about um, Ayn Rand overall, because she's a totally, like she is absolutely intelligent enough to have read Murray Rothbard. And there was enough written at this time about the concept that, you know, it was all out there she would have read it, she would have come across these arguments, so it's not like she's writing in, you know, um, 1800 or something like that, you know, th these arguments had already been totally um, uh, fleshed out, and yet she completely dismissed them with no real logical, logical basis, and that's, that's got to be a psychological thing. Um, so yeah, that was, um, that was a real disappointment. Well, she didn't even have to read Murray Rothbard's books. She knew him for however many years, right? Yeah, and she had to... For uh, damn sure if she talked to him. She yeah. knew his, She knew the ideas. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting, and this is something that um, I, I, she says in the book, and I just thought this, this, is, this is sort of so... This just doesn't, doesn't fit for me, but she talks about there being no conflict of interest possible between rational people. And she goes on to say, like, oh, you might think that if two people were applying for the same job, then they have a conflict of interest. But let me tell you, actually, that, you know, rational people understand that it's, you know, that, that um, the best person will get the job and that there's other jobs out there that they will then go and find themselves. And she makes this argument how there cannot be a conflict of interest between rational people and I understand what she's trying to do because she's trying to get away from the idea that the marketplace is just like this ruthless vicious um everyone is out to you know uh ruin everyone else type competition she's trying to trying to introduce the concept of win-win negotiations and say look it's possible for everyone to you know work in a competitive way and still have ethics and still work together and so I kind of understand where she's going with it but I don't think it is true that there's no such thing as a conflict of interest between rational people because um, you know the fact is that even if there's, there's if there's two people who want to go for a job even if one of them is slightly higher qualified and the other one understands that it's still the case that they both want that job and they do have a conflict of interest in that, you know, one of them is, is not going to be able to get the job if the other one gets it. That doesn't mean to say that they're out to, you know, that doesn't mean to say that they're going to be, you know, underhand about it or anything. But I don't really, I don't really know why she decided to, why she needed to kind of make such a blanket statement like that, you know. Well, I think it's, it's the outcome. So once you don't get the job because you're not good enough or the other person is better than you, then you go like, oh, oh well, okay. It's because that person is better and therefore there is no conflict, really. I, I, that's, how, that's the only way I can interpret it. Well, what about in Atlas Shrugged where there's these uh, like three different dudes that are competing for Dagny Taggart and they're just, you know, each one's like, Oh well, I guess you know the next guy gets it because gets her because uh, <clears throat> uh, he's better than I am. He's a he's a better industrialist or whatever, uh, or a better inventor. And so uh, you know, there's there's no conflict of interest here. We're just all going to agree that uh, the best man gets the uh, gets the woman. Yeah, I'm surprised I didn't arrange a sort of uh, shared ownership agreement. <laughs> They didn't get to choose like two days a week, three days if you're a better industrialist or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Which was funny and ironic because she actually had a polyamorous relationship. Supposedly. Yes, that's true. She <laughs> did, didn't she? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, but in the character, that, one of them had to win and get him. <laughs> Right, right. And at the, at the risk of sounding really glib, though, about Ayn Rand and like bringing it back to her personal life, I mean, what did she do when there was a conflict of interest? Well, she just said that one of them wasn't 
rational, right? Okay, problem solved. There's no conflict of interest between rational people. The, the, she, that was her way of solving that puzzle. Instead of saying, oh, maybe rational people do have conflicts of interest, she just picks one of these two people and is like, oh, yeah, this person's not rational. Okay, cool. We're, we're, still not, we're still not in this puzzle. Yeah. One thing I did appreciate about the book was her takedown of lifeboat scenarios, though, because I, I thought that 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 was one of the first times that I had read a really, really cogent and concise takedown of like the philosophy 101 ethics you know, lifeboat scenarios that come up. Right. I mean, this is as far as I remember, she basically just says, you know, why are you wasting your time on this? totally these total irrelevancies these, <laughs> yeah these things never happen and the fact that you're focusing on them shows that you are trying to avoid the big issues basically is that, that's pretty much her argument right yeah and the ethics of emergencies wherein she says that you know in a what she de describes as a metaphysical emergency so like a place that you can't survive, like water or fire, or you know, that is a meta a change in situation. You you run out of money, and you need your neighbors run out of money and is penniless and can't afford food, and you can afford to buy them a meal. Okay, well that's you you should do that, but you shouldn't self sacrifice to do that. And th I thought that was a really good kind of yeah, way of getting does. around that question. Yes, yeah. that's very good. I, I come across that argument a lot talking about and then it's it's really good that um, she explained it very well the answer to it. yeah that's right she just goes through and actually unpacks how these so-called emergencies are, or, or so-called um, sort of contradictions aren't really they're just dramatic situations that are incredibly unusual and not really don't actually really impact on the principle of the matter yeah, yeah, like I, I get the question all the time, like, oh, you know, you're a capitalist and free market, uh, you devote to free markets and all. What are we going to do about that person who has this rare disease that he cannot get a job and he cannot get a, get a girlfriend? And obviously, society has to pay for him. So I tell him, fine, let's make a list of all these people and just pay them. But, you know, the principle <laughs> cannot be based on, you know, the, the list of people that cannot do anything in their life. Yeah, I I actually, it's it's really interesting um, talking about this because I just remember this is when I was just getting into um, sort of libertarianism um, about sort of eight years ago, uh, and I at the time I was reading Milton Friedman and I was making a lot of arguments about market efficiency and so forth, but I remember that I actually did get someone a friend of mine at the time making the argument to me, like, and it literally got to the stage, I remember in the conversation thinking, this is ridiculous, because it got to the stage where this guy was saying, okay, what about someone who doesn't have any arms and doesn't have any legs, and they're just <laughs> lying there, what about them? And I remember thinking, like, you've got to be kidding me, you know, this is just, that, this, is, this is weird, because that's, that's sort of, that's the emergency situation way of arguing which is which is that's the kind of um sort of ex extreme um ridiculous level of argument that it gets to. and then and then if you say okay you know maybe it's better for him that he dies you know you're branded uh, you know kind of heartless from that moment on and then your arguments are ignored which is frustrating because you let that guy with no arms no legs and whatever Die. Okay. Yeah, you, you're the kind of guy who wants to see all the people who are lying in the street with no arms and no legs just die. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Luckily, I, I don't uh, it, deal. I don't deal with that kind of uh, that kind of argument anymore. What is it what though it's... that you know? I know I'm in philosophy, and then, for example, uh, the same thing happens with Austrian economists that they're not taught at university. So when you go to university. Uh, you learn 90% Keynesian economics and, uh, you know, Austrian economists are sometimes discussed very briefly. And the same thing with uh, Ayn Rand, if you take any introduction to philosophy course, I doubt she would be included in it. And okay, I understand the criticisms that we have uh, over her work and yes, there are some um, contradictions, even though she wouldn't like it. but. 
There's contradictions in John Stuart Mill's uh, utilitarianism and David Hume's work and Kant and all of that. No one seems to be as uh, as devotedly against it, against them as it is with Ayn Rand, and they just uh, completely ignore her in terms of, uh, you know, showing at least the valid points of her philosophy in uh, any university course. Yes, absolutely. I think it's. Um very telling about how the intelligentsia is co-opted into, uh, into statism, that Ayn Rand is, is completely shunned and just ignored. And as you say, even if it was to, even if it was to, uh, even if she was addressed w warts and all with the contradictions, she's still an incredibly successful 20th century, like writer and philosopher who, whose work has reached millions and millions of people. She's made a huge, uh, um, dent in in uh sort of the in intellectual history and yet she is totally ignored and uh and would never never get taught in those situations and you know the funny thing is is what you think about contradictions you know karl marx his work is unbelievably contradictory it's so self-contradictory that mark and marx knew it i was reading an interesting article about him today once he published, uh, he didn't want to publish das kapital because he realized that the labor of theory of value was completely contradictory and fell apart. So he held off for 10 years until like basically Frederick Engels, I think, got him to finally publish volume one. And then he refused to publish volumes two and three. They were done po posthumously because he knew that they only made the argument more contradictory and worse and showed like the contradictions up more, more clearly. And um, Gary North, this article I was reading, he makes the argument that if it wasn't for Lenin and the Russian Revolution, you know, people wouldn't treat Marx as a philosopher or as a, you know, great thinker because it's only because of, of, you know, the actual political events that people read these books as if they were some kind of, you know, uh, deep and meaningful text, or at least they used to. Um, and uh, so it's amazing, like, you, you'll still read, you'll still get Marx taught in universities, um, but you won't get Ayn Rand. Yes. You have, all, you, you have degrees basically on Marxism. You don't just get taught, you, you know, you probably have, I don't know, you, you must have some degrees that are like in Marxist philosophy or bachelors in, I don't know, Marxist uh, history. Or something. Well, it, it's, yeah, if you do sociology, then you, yeah. get loads of, you get loads of marks. I just wanted to say, I think it's interesting that the Ayn Rand Institute, I, I don't know a huge amount about it, but um, What's really interesting for me is that um, to see, like, after Ayn Rand's death, when her ideas live on. Actually, firstly, just to say before that, I totally agree with you that, you know, the people who criticize Ayn Rand, who criticize her, I think, well, are people from, from the libertarian principled side who are talking about, well, okay, if you're for non aggression, then why aren't you consistent and so forth? She obviously comes under a lot of attack from the left just for being. It just for being market oriented and I think that's really really you know there's a lot of really unfair criticism of Ayn Rand and but but I do think it's interesting that um, if you look at her the organization that lives off that lives on after her death the two really important um, things that Ayn Rand got wrong I think are things that have sort of poisoned that organization um, the first is her belief in the state, and the second is her belief in intellectual property. And if you look at it, what I, what I see from the Ayn Rand Institute, the two, th the two areas where I think that they've gone kind of uh, gone wrong is, one is they do have quite strong support for um, a militarist foreign policy of the United States. And Ayn Rand did this as well. Um, and that's because it goes right back to her belief that we do need the military um, and police powers to be um, a monopoly uh, controlled by the state and that there are, quote, good countries and, quote, bad countries. And so, for example, the Iron Rand Institute was quite, uh, as far as I understand, quite pro um, the Iraq war and going over and um, bombing bombing the shit out of Iraq, basically. And that comes, that comes from the, the background that Ayn Rand left in, the, in, in her belief in the state, because they still have a belief in the virtue yeah. of the American state. 
And that's I, really unfortunate. I think the reason the reason behind it, why why she says that, is because she came from um, the USSR and uh, she. Obviously, had uh, she loved her family, maybe she had a lot of friends there or whatever. Who th she thought, okay, these people, they are being enslaved by the majority here or by the government or whatever you want to call it. And uh, uh, w what can I do to help them? So if uh, I, I, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of an Iraqi or a, or a person from the USSR or somewhere else who has escaped, uh, has managed to get to the States or to England or whatever, and uh, I'm thinking, okay, what can I do? What can I do for those that I've left behind? Well, uh, there's not much else you can do. I mean, you cannot trade with a dictator. There's, there's not much else you can do other than go and bomb him, uh, hoping that your bombs will miss your friends. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a... I, I, understand, I understand, though, where she's coming from. I think you're probably right. Um, that that is probably the way it worked in her head. It's obviously a sadly uh, and totally misguided um, idea, uh, which results in in the mess that we got now. Yeah. But I think that is probably the way she self justified it. And yeah, unfortunately, it's left a really bad legacy with the Iron Man Institute. And the other thing, just um, just to finish it off, is her belief in intellectual property. Um, and she was so hardcore about it, has meant that the Iron Rand Institute doesn't, is really, really uh, restrictive about um, Iron Rand's work. And that's a real shame because, I mean, the Mises Institute just basically puts PDFs online for free. And I think it would be great if the Iron Rand Institute did that too, because it's more important to get her, um, to her work out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she doesn't need the money anymore. She's gone and she didn't have any kids. So what the hell are they doing? They should be. They should it be was spread. really interesting, actually. The Adam Smith, uh, the the one the, the one uh, lecture that happened at the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, there were about, uh, I think, in the room about a couple of hundred people, and they had on every chair a free copy of Atlas Shrugged. Well, that's great, but this is the the, the age of the internet. I mean, what, yes. what, what about what about in every inbox? You know, I think I think I think the le the lecturer, that John Allison guy, I think he paid for it basically, and uh, this is how they understand it. You know, you you can do it if you are willing to pay for for it. You can you can uh, you can distribute the material, but uh, not for free, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Jake, have you seen the video with you know? Because you were like with the the militaristic foreign policy. Have you seen the video of Leonard Peikoff on the O'Reilly Factor, where Bill O'Reilly basically has to talk Peikoff after be out of being such a warmonger? No, I haven't. Yeah, when Bill O'Reilly is talking you out of being such a dick, like you should probably like rethink a thing or two. Like he, it was crazy, and like the first line out of Peikoff's mouth is like, "I am not concerned with the lives of innocents." In that that like crazy ass voice and he he just says that like it's their fault for being in an anti-rational society and we should like just nuke iran and get that over with and it's just bill o'reilly even ends the segment he's like wow i uh don't know where to go from there right <laughs> 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 and at one point he, he like he's just saying to dr Vigo, like, okay doctor doctor chill take a step back breathe take a breath right <laughs> it's crazy and his podcast is like you should totally listen to it he has an episode about you know kinky rough sex which is awesome hearing leonard peikoff talk about um he's got an episode about transgenders and how that's anti-rational and therefore immoral because you don't define man by the freaks in society you define man by um you know their metaphysical nature and all that kind of. He's just yeah, yeah, that, that, that doesn't make much sense, isn't it? Because what was a freak uh, in terms of preferences? I don't know, uh, twenty years ago. I mean, he's not a freak now. And tap dancing may have been really good. And... <laughs> <laughs> if you go out to a nightclub and start tap dancing, you're the freak. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Oh, yeah, yeah that's no. true. That's true. You can spot the one rational person in the club. The guy tapped on. <laughs> but yeah, like Leonard, he's just with jazz like, hands. This, 
Oh god, that's funny. But he's just this nut job when it comes to the. Uh, they are they are definitely beating the the war drums for Iran. I actually yeah. know someone who's about to start working for the Ayn Rand Institute, and I'm like you know, a couple more tweets away from unfollowing him on Twitter because he's just, oh, it's just, he, he doesn't come out and say, like, yeah, we should go slaughter those innocents, but it's definitely, like, a little bit more on the on the right than, I, than I'm yeah. comfortable with. Well, it's, um, Leonard Peikoff became, like, he was sort of like the last man standing after Ayn Rand had fallen out with everyone else. And I think the reason that he was there was because he was kind of, I, I think it was because he was the least, he was pro probably the most kind of, subservient to her in a way which is a real shame because it means that he's been the one who's been like her so-called intellectual heir or um and 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 he's now just like a really crazy grumpy old man isn't he he's basically just like, as you say yeah. it's just it's his podcast i have i have heard a couple of them and it's this incredibly like it, he's a real just like get off my lawn type old guy you know <laughs> yeah well he actually has an episode and there his episodes are actually only like three minutes each there is each of them is basically a listener question and then he answers it um one of his episodes is about like what should i do about my neighbor's yappy dog and do i have the right to shoot it or something and he, i think he comes down i could be totally misrepresenting him but i'm pretty sure he comes down on the side of since the dog's barking is impeding into like the sound waves are in in Croaching on your property rights, you actually do have the right to silence the dog with a BB gun or some kind of, you know, force if necessary, because it's encroaching on your property rights. Yeah, he he also wrote. Uh, he he also did one where I remember him saying about how he'd got into some legal dispute with a neighbor, and it was this case where he like immediately sued. I can't remember what the neighbor did, but the neighbor I don't know they banged on the wall or something, and he sued them. And so then, and then he sued them again, and I, and he sort of immediately went to the court system. It was like, wow, you know, <laughs> what about negotiation? <laughs> well, we're just asking to uh, turn please, it down. Leave, <laughs> please leave a note on my door if you're going to have a party. All right, cool. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh God. I, uh. Yeah. It, it, for for anyone who hasn't heard them, they are quite quite funny it's just and for the, a bit of comedy relief the best thing about them is you can pretty you don't it's not like there are five <laughs> it's months. definitely like the neighbor was tap dancing <laughs> <laughs> no the best thing about the literacy podcast though is that you, it's not like five of them are funny and then like 500 of them are just kind of boring lectury no like you can pick like any 20 random ones and like 19 of them will just be like asinine and just hilarious <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i think um this has been an awesome fun but um i i pretty much said everything i have to say about this book does anybody does anybody have, have any last points that they wanted to uh to, to add or things to to say i just wanted to say very quickly uh what i enjoyed most about the book was uh it seems like ayn rand had a real I spent a lot of uh, energy and time sort of surveying the different uh, moral theories that were out there in the world uh, during her time and did a, a, an amazing job of deconstructing them and, and showing exactly why they were wrong. And uh, I just really admire about, admire, admired that about her. And um, it's exciting to me to see how some of her contemporaries came up with um, more well better better moral theories and how much they borrowed from her and, and you know used her as a uh, a springboard to, to for their work yeah do you mean like the way that she influenced basically the libertarian movement right yeah i agree i think she's uh, you know she's still like for all of her weird contradictions um she's still an incredibly important person who who obviously had a massive impact and she didn't she didn't really have that much impact on me because I read I read the people who she obviously impacted on first so you know I read Murray Rothbard before I read Ayn Rand but um, but it's clear that she had a huge impact on on everyone around her and uh, so yeah I, well, I think she's the only one with a good story isn't it the only one with a not, not a not a sound argument but a good novel uh, something that you would enjoy actually reading right you mean because she gave her arguments in novel form 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, we are missing that. We are missing that in the in the libertarian movement. You know, there's not enough people creating art that represents our uh, thoughts. You know, and novel is the best way to do it. So she she did it while Mary Rothbard didn't, or anyone else. Yeah. So I also think that she has. Um, I when you first said that, I thought you meant her personal story. No, 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 no. But I just wanted to say that I also think she has a pretty amazing personal story to yes. escape the Soviet Union and become a best-selling author in the West. You know, Murray Rothbard was basically an academic who hung around trying to get a university position all his life. It's not really that interesting a personal story, you know, <laughs> compared to um, to Ayn Rand, who like she really was like, uh, you know, a bit like a Randian. Uh, novel yeah. hero in her life story not obviously there was lots of uh, dark sides to it and everything but still i think it's pretty impressive what she did i believe there is a parallel between what is going on in the gulch in the in gulch gulch and what um she did by basically immigrating i think uh, i think she did the same thing i think she she considers immigration as just moving to the gulch yeah absolutely and I do, I do really agree with um, when I interviewed Jeff Tucker, he was saying uh, the thing about Ayn Rand, it's like it, he's, he views her as sort of like a member of his, it's like his sister or something. It's like, I can criticize her, but nobody else can. <laughs> and I know what he means. It's like when you see the, the left wing criticisms of Ayn Rand, who, who just basically say she's nuts. Um, I think that's, uh, I, I really, I really don't like that, but I, I feel that from a principled standpoint, there's a lot of criticisms that can be made of her, but uh, it's just a shame that the ones that do get made of her are all the wrong ones. Yeah. But yeah, as I was saying, she's, she's, she makes an interesting book, you know, the novel that she wrote and all that. We don't have many people that make these arguments and make it entertaining to read. This is why, for example, if anyone, uh, if, any, if I meet uh, someone who is not aware of libertarianism or the principles behind I will not give them a Mises, um, you know, article or book or something. I would give them the fountainhead because I know that they're not going to fall asleep. Well, they may fall asleep reading it, but it's a bit more interesting and it has a storyline. And the, the, we're missing that. If you look at left wing, uh, th there's a lot of books about you know left wing stuff and the, the novels and they make it interesting and all of that. There's nothing in free market in defense of the free market, really. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Well, even in their nonfiction quote nonfiction, like their columns and their articles and stuff, I think someone like Paul Krugman is much better at weaving a narrative than a lot of libertarian yes. authors are. I mean, he's completely you know he's just making shit up half the time, but he's at least telling a story, right? I wasn't brave enough. There was a, a Paul Krugman um, a lecture a couple of weeks ago that I attended, huge, obviously, at the London School of Economics, nothing like the ones that, that I said at the Adam Smith Institute. And I wanted to dress up as an alien. <laughs> and I, and say, I'm here to stimulate the economy. <laughs> but I didn't do it in the end. I was, I was uh, too weak. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have expected him to, you know, embrace you with open arms. Finally! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, hilarious. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for coming along. I've really enjoyed the chat. I hope you guys, uh, hope you guys enjoyed it too. Yeah, thanks. It was great fun. Thank thanks. you so thanks. much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I uh, enjoyed listening. Awesome. Good night, everyone. Good night. Okay. Good night, Jake. Okay. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.